at what point the minister will be joining us. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think we can hand over to Mr. Linton now. Um, Linton, um, you are muted. You are still Come muted. On. Yeah, the voice is not audible, please. Kindly. Yeah, my apologies. You are muted I hope you again. can hear me now. Now we can. Okay. No, good, uh, good afternoon and my sincere apologies. Um, for 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 the challenges that... but my apologies can you hear me now can i proceed yes please you are audible please proceed. thank you very much and uh, once again sincere apologies for the minister uh, not being able to join um she's in a cabinet meeting at the moment and she will attempt uh, to join the meeting a little later um uh, towards the closure of the meeting uh, so um, I we beg your indulgence in this regard. Thank you very much, Program Director, Dr. Ashok Babu, uh, distinguished uh, leaders 
of the delegations of the BRICS member states, senior government officials from the BRICS member states and other member states that may be attending this meeting, uh, experts, other participants from different sectors within the BRICS uh, membership, esteemed ladies and gentlemen. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and um, evening, depending on what time of the day you are in uh, the country that you are in at the moment. Um, let me take this opportunity um, on behalf of the Minister of Social Development to thank each and every one uh, of you for having made time out of your very uh, busy schedules to join us here uh, in this webinar session. Um, it is a great pleasure um, uh, for me on behalf of the Minister of the Republic of South Africa of Social Development to welcome you to this uh, BRICS webinar on uh, cooperation and population matters that we have uh, organized as the government of the Republic of South Africa in collaboration with the uh, current BRICS chair, the government of India, under the theme, the demographic impact of COVID-19 and response measures in BRICS countries. As a government of South Africa, um, we see this as an opportunity to revive the BRICS cooperation on population related matters in the main, in which we all pledge to cooperate and share experiences in population matters and strengthen South to South cooperation on matters of common interest. Esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, prior to the 2013 BRICS summit, the member states agreed to collaborate through dialogue, cooperation, sharing of experiences and capacity building on population related matters um, uh, of mutual interest. Subsequently, the Etseguini Action Plan of the 2013 BRICS Summit mandated meetings of population matters, such as the one we have convened here today. BRICS member countries have several challenges and opportunities in common uh, when it comes to population matters, and we can mutually benefit from our collaborative efforts. The prime objectives of this cooperation is to exchange knowledge and experiences on each other's country's population trends, dynamics, and policy responses, but also to identify further areas of cooperation. Our government is proud to co-host this webinar, which provides us with the platform for sharing information and knowledge on demographic perspectives on the impact of COVID-19 amongst BRICS member states. Without any doubt, the COVID-19 crisis has exposed pre-pandemic fault lines and laid bare some sobering truths about our world. While the full impact of the pandemic is still emerging and we're already witnessing its immediate disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable children, youth, women, and persons with disabilities and older persons, of course, these impact, uh, these impact uh, uh, or rather the impact tends to occur in our regional contexts. With what I mean, with what I mean, or rather what I mean here um, is that the outcomes of any number of interventions that a country can implement are substantially affected by the trends and management of the pandemic in, region, in the region where the country is located. The pandemic has lightened the need, or rather highlighted the need for policymakers to collectively consider how it interacts with population dynamics and its, impl its, imp its implications for socioeconomic well-being and, the, and in the long run, of course, for the demographic dividend. I'm deliberately highlighting the demographic dividend because this is the lens through which many African countries look into the future. As part of our efforts to reimagine the well-being of vulnerable groups in the new normal, the South African government and the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, hosted a webinar on a series on, um, a webinar series rather, on demographic and demography and COVID-19 in Africa late in 2020. We sought and secured the participation of many African governments and from academics and civil society organizations from across the continent. What we learned from each other was that the pandemic had amplified challenges to the youth and threatened the African continent's prospects of harnessing the demographic dividend. Although many governments have taken an array 
of prevention and response measures to prevent the further spread of the virus. They have had uh, disruptive impl implications for the health sector, education and training, and job opportunities. Women and youth were and are still the hardest hit, particularly with regards to access to sexual and reproductive health and rights, services, and increase and an increase in gender-based violence and femicide. To safeguard the demographic dividend from the impact of COVID-19, there is a need to come up with strategic and targeted inter, um, evidence um, on which to base short and long-term recovery strategies. We have also learned that the pandemic also threatened the achievement of the 2030 I think there is some uh, signal issue. So, I think there is some signal issue there. We request to uh, South Africa, they may come back and the signal resumes. Now, uh, the opening remarks, there's a pre-recorded video statement from Mr. Rajesh Bhushan, Secretary of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, let me start with extending a warm greeting from the people of India. The world population stands today at 7.9 billion and the BRICS countries alone contribute to more than 40% of this. The sheer population share determines the overall global impact on my, my all apologies. aspects of development that BRICS countries have globally achieved and are striving to achieve. This is an opportune time because we are in the midst of tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. So we must reflect on our pandemic response and related factors in COVID countries. I sincerely believe that the in-depth deliberations of this webinar will offer a way to understand and rationally plan the strategies for controlling the pandemic. As far as COVID-19 response is concerned, in India, a country of 1.3 billion people, one of the world's largest and most vibrant democracies, we have demonstrated national solidarity under the dynamic leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi. The mission is to reform and manage the health sector effectively to deliver comprehensive quality health services that are equitably distributed that are accessible and sustainable for all people of the country. India has focused on a simple but a multi-pronged strategy which has its focus on test, track, treat, vaccinate and follow COVID appropriate behavior. We have realized in the last year and a half that this strategy that rests on five pillars has brought down the number of cases from a high of 1 million to 125,000 active cases last year and currently below 100,000 active cases. The active cases today account for mere 0.3% of our population. Currently, we are armed with adequate number of beds oxygen supply, ventilators, medicines, 
diagnostic kits, national clinical management protocol, and we have built capacity across the available human resource by continuously orienting, reorienting, and repurposing them. And this is a dynamic and evolving process. The vaccination drive against COVID-19 in India has been taken up vigorously. Presently, we have one of the largest vaccination drive globally going on in our country. And I'm satisfied to say that India has so far delivered more than 1.2 billion doses using two indigenously manufactured vaccines. Since we are a country of diversity, difficult terrain, vast distances, we have also launched drone initiative to deliver vaccines in hard to reach areas. India's demographic dividend in the context of COVID-19 is of specific relevance. Making country self-reliant has been one of the key strategies and this is very aptly articulated by our Honorable Prime Minister when he says Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Vishwas or Sabka Prayas collective efforts, inclusive growth, everyone's trust, and through everyone's effort. This strategy has been reflected on the ground in the fact that from an importer of masks and PPE kits and ventilators, India has emerged as one of the major exporters of these items today. India's strategy involves not just containing the virus but also protecting our population. The federal government as well as the state governments are working very closely together in close collaboration not only to minimize the number of cases and their consequences but also to combat the continuously evolving challenges. In this effort of the government, all other entities outside government, whether they are medical associations, NGOs, uh, other volunteers, they have all come proactively forward and joined hands with the government. Global solidarity and a people-centric approach has remained at the center of India's vision to combat the pandemic. We have actively reached out for global action at various international platforms and we have actively collaborated with all stakeholders to ensure equitable access not only to vaccines, diagnostics and drugs but also sharing of the evolving knowledge about the pandemic. COVID-19 has impacted us in different ways. As we proceed with today's deliberations, let us be mindful of the fact that COVID pandemic is not the first and would not be the last of such pandemics. Pandemics and emergencies evoke focused responses and whole of government as well as whole of society approach. COVID-19 has taught us that what will work is adopting this collective approach of whole of government as well as all sections of the society. The global impact of COVID-19 can be mitigated only if all nations work together in a concerted manner. It would also help if global best practices are shared for replication. The ongoing pandemic may have forced us to press the pause button for some time, but we must not forget that economies, societies and nations must keep on moving. Never in the modern world have governments, industry and civil society been so united in working together, in collectively forging a way ahead. Global cooperation is essential for supporting vulnerable populations, 
and achieving a sustainable and inclusive global recovery. As I mentioned earlier, BRICS countries will have a significant role to play in these responses. We all have large and significant human resource and a huge opportunity of utilizing our demographic dividend and together we must collectively stand strong to mitigate the effects of the pandemic and to share knowledge. I once again thank you for having given me this opportunity. Thank you. Namaste. I thank uh, Mr. Rajesh Bhushan for the opening remarks. There was some technical snag uh, from South Africa. We'll just get back before the expert's presentation. Now I request opening statements from the country Brazil. Opening statements, please. If Brazil is not available, we can move to the next country. Okay. Now we move to the opening statement from China. I request Mr. Du Ziu. Uh, my apologies, my pronunciation is incorrect. Commissioner, Department of Population Surveillance and Family Development, National Health Commission, Government of China. Honorable President, Specialists, Ladies and Gentlemen, Friends, Good Afternoon. It's my pleasure to join this meeting to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on demographics. The Chinese government has accumulated valuable experience in terms of combating the COVID-19 and provided valuable experience for various countries. We value health and we have taken the most comprehensive strategy in quarantining and changing the transmission routes of the, of the virus by prevention and complete quarantine. And we balanced the prevention control of the COVID-19 and the economy's growth. We have done our best to control the COVID-19 and minimize its impact. And we have achieved a very well-earned success. Although the COVID-19 has caused um, many impact to the social and economic development and influenced the achievement of the 2013 Sustainable Development Goal, but we have taken a series of measures. Say, for example, we control the movement of crowds and we see more challenges in terms of policy making and demographic workers should see how we can make use of what we of, of our knowledge and our observations and look at how COVID-19 affects our population, marriages, fertility, and mitigate the negative impacts. I'd like to raise three points. Firstly, we should build a model for interaction between the COVID-19 and the population, i.e. the impact model. The various countries are different in terms of population structure and the progress and the impact of the COVID-19. 
we should look at the differences. Say, for example, does COVID in influence each country the same way or differently? That will help us to make to create a more state, stable, interactive model. Secondly, we should enforce the demographic observation during the prevention and control of the COVID. The Chinese government issue daily, monthly reports in terms of the most recent COVID-19 data. During this prevention and control of the COVID, we had made use of the demographic
during those uh, webinars uh, exchange our policies and our measures which we have worked out through the pandemic uh, time and best uh, based on the best practices uh, which we can exchange and share on different uh, platforms we can uh, better work out uh, uh, our own measures uh, to combat uh, COVID-19 so it's very important to cooperate on BRICS platform and we want to express our deep gratitude uh, to all the participants that our cooperation carries on that we can continue our cooperation and exchange of our uh, experience and uh, we uh, are very grateful to everybody uh, from BRICS countries. COVID-19 influenced all our spheres of life, including democratic uh, status of the society. For the Russian Federation, the democratic uh, pro pro problem is, first of all, the uh, internal policy, and uh, that is why pandemic COVID-19, which brought out various problems, only helped us from the point of view of developing new policies and support of our population to single out the demog demog demographic problems that we have to deal with. And we, uh, we uh, wish uh, success to the webinar, and I hope that uh, this event will be very fruitful and useful for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. There was some technical snag when South Africa was written the statement. Can you please continue? Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and once again, apologies for the um, the the challenges with the with the with the technology on our end. Um, as you would see, we have a challenge with the, with the, with lights where where we are. Thank you. Let me just continue from where I, I ended off. Um, Honourable Chair, uh, the pandemic has highlighted the need for policymakers to collective uh, collectively consider how it interacts with population dynamics and its implications for socioeconomic well-being and in the long run for the demographic dividend. I'm deliberately highlighting the demographic dividend because this is the lens through which many African countries look into the future. As part of our efforts to reimagine the well-being of vulnerable groups in the new normal, the South African government and the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, hosted a series of, um, uh, of webinar, webinars on, the demo, on demography and, co and COVID-19 in Africa late in 2020. We sought and secured the participation of many African countries uh, and acad from academics to civil society organizations um, across the entire continent. What we, what we learned from each other was that the pandemic had amplified challenges to the youth uh, and threatened the African continent's pros prospects of harnessing the demographic dividend. Although many governments have taken an array of prevention and response measures to prevent the further spread of the virus, they have had disruptive implications for the health sector, education and training, and job opportunities. Women and youth were at the, were, were still the hardest hit, particularly with regards to access to sexual and reproductive health and rights services, and an increase in gender-based violence and femicide. To safeguard the demographic dividend from the impact of COVID-19, there is, a, there is a need to come up with, with, this, with strategic and targeted evidence on which to base short and long-term recovery strategies. We have also learned that the pandemic also threatens the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which can only be attained by investing in our young people in a meaningful way. For example, through education and training, jobs and health, including sexual and reproductive health and rights. The upheavals caused by the pandemic present a need for, demograph for demographers and policymakers within BRICS countries to consider the emerging evidence, the, in, uh, the interaction between pandemic um, and population dynamics and its implications for socioeconomic well-being. 
being in the long run, and the effectiveness of different response measures adopted by our countries in their fight of the, pandem of the epidemic, um, and how our post-COVID-19 recovery plans can be informed and sustained by evidence and pop on population dynamics. I have no doubt that today's meeting will provide an important platform for us as BRICS member states to share our country's experiences and develop joint steps together, uh, working towards reaching a better understanding on how population dynamics uh, interact with pandemics, in this case, COVID-19, and how demography, demographic science can provide new insights into how the pandemic may unfold and the intensity and type of measures needed to slow it down. And of course, rekindle our country's continued commitments towards BRICS cooperation on population matters for the benefits of our country and the peoples of our countries. I therefore hope that every individual in this platform will feel free to contribute fully and honestly to the deliberations in the next few hours. And I wish uh, you every success in the deliberations and pledge our government's continued support towards this important initiative. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the participants in the opening session. Now let us move to the session that is the officials and experts from different countries. In the interest of time, each country I request to take approximately 15 minutes. Now let us start with presentation from Ms. Isabel uh, Mari. My apologies if I pronounce incorrect. The demographer, Brazilian Institute for Geography and Statistics, Government of Brazil. Please start the presentation. Good morning, everyone. And on behalf of the Brazilian Institute for Geographics and Statistics, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of sharing experience, experiences and data from Brazil on demographic perspective. Um, first of all, I'd like to, I'm sorry, just a second, okay, all right. I'd like to um, give you a demographic and socioeconomic context of Brazil. Our population is estimated to be uh, 213 million people as of July 1st. Uh, we are divided or distributed in five great regions, 26 states and one federal district. And uh, in between five, among 5,570 municipalities. We also um, have some territory inequalities such as social economic, population distribution and aid structure, which I will show you next. This map shows you um, the Brazilian states and divided in, into five great regions. In the top in green, we can see where the states where the Amazon is. And in the Southeast uh, is where Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro are located, the most populated um, states in Brazil. Uh, if we look, if you take a look at the economics, uh, th this graph shows the GDP, the gross uh, domestic product, and, and where the, the, the most um, economic um, uh, developed regions are. So we can see that Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and, and in the south of Brazil, as where the most uh, developed um, states are. Uh, about population density, our population is uh, distributed and concentrated, I'm sorry, in the southeast, in the south of Brazil, and along the coast. And if we take a look at population um, over 25 years of age, this map shows the percentage uh, of population 65 over, and, and it's clearly that the aged population is located or concentrated in the south of Brazil. This is a map of municipalities. So, in a COVID perspective, we would uh, imagine that the population most vulnerable, vulnerable uh, to the COVID spread would be um, located in the south and southeast of Brazil. Uh, if we talk about COVID and age infection and about infection, there are no significant differences of COVID-19 infection by age. But when it comes to hospitalization and deaths, 
yes, there is an increasing risk of age. And that's what we see from data from Brazil. If we take the death registries in, um, in between 19, 2019 and 2020, we saw an increase of almost 15% in death registries in Brazil. And the graph shows where, um, um, the graph shows that uh, the greatest increase were among the, the elderly. And they were a little higher uh, among men than women. Uh, from the subnational, subnational perspective, uh, we would think, and from a demographic perspective, that the South would suffer more from, from the increase in death registries. But what we see is very, the opposite. Um, the North was the, the region that most suffered from the increasing deaths. Um, th this graph shows uh, the increasing deaths by men and women and by age groups. So the South suffered the, uh, the least in Brazil um, and followed by the Southeast where the most uh, economic developed regions um, are. So this gives us an idea that uh, demographics is only part of it, part of the problem, right? We have to take into account population living standards, access to quality health services, such as assistance and vaccines and access to vaccines, and all the actions taken by local and federal gov governments in order to tackle COVID-19. And this is very important when we talk about um, uh, subnational um, indicators. But besides the, the impact on deaths, we could also see impact on births. Uh, we saw a decrease of almost 4.7% um, 4, 4 in birth registries in between 1920. Uh, 19, uh, 2019 and 2020. And we also saw a decrease in marriages registries that went down at 26% in Brazil. Um, we, what we are still following, and it seems that they are going, um, getting back to, to an increased number in, in marriages registries uh, from uh, 2021 on. Um, and uh, besides births and, and marriages, we still have migration and, and international migration uh, is, is very small concerning total population in Brazil, but it's very relevant for some northern states population, such as Roraima, which is in the very north in Brazil and, a, and has borders with Venezuela. Uh, what we saw was that because of closing borders, uh, international migration went down in, 19, uh, in 20, 2020. And it has uh, increased again from mid uh, 20, 2021 with the reopening of the borders. And about internal migration, the only information source is demographic census. We have no such registries for internal migration. So we must wait for the next census to, to have an idea of what's going on on, on population distribution uh, after the COVID pandemic. So it's important also to say that uh, we, we, we saw a 15% increase in deaths registries, but we already know that uh, um, the increase in deaths in 2021 in Brazil would be much harder than that than in 2020. No, we still don't have the, the final uh, data, of course. So uh, after all this and after all this time, um, we know that the primary role for demography in tackling COVID-19 is to give population, uh, to give society an accurate national and subnational, subnational population estimates, always disaggregated by sex and age. And um, for doing that, we have to face Great challenges. First of all, our latest demographic census dates to 2010. So we are working with uh, projects, projections since then. Um, so after 11 years or 12 years from the last census, of course, it uh, would be much better if we had another population count. 
And 2020 demographic census was postponed first because of COVID-19 of COVID uh, pandemics. And then on 2021, demographic census was postponed again due to budget constraint. So we're going to face hard times because also of budget constraints on, on uh, in every country, right? And now demographic census is planned to take place in 2022 after a federal guard court determination for it to, to take place next year. And we are working hard on it. But after not only we will we, we need, we'll have further challenges to face uh, even if when even if even if we have the census uh, done next year, uh, and the, the questions are how will demographic components change the next years? We don't know that yet. So for mortality, for example, um, return to pre-pandemic levels is expected. We just don't know when exactly um, the the, the pre-pandemic level will be um, um, returned. Would that be in 2022, 2023? And, and how are we going to protect that after it goes back to uh, pre-pandemic level? Uh, also, changes in social relations, labor relations can lead to changes in behavior in general that may affect fertility and migration. So uh, for fertility, for example, we see a decrease in the number of births since um, the last years, and it um, became even greater in 1920. And but we don't know the impact for the near future or for the long run. And how is the the, uh, the tendencies going to change from what we already knew or what we already expected for it to change? Also concerning migration, uh, as I already said, the census is the only source for internal migration estimates, and we really need that information. Um, for us to, to work on, on better estimates. As la last remarks, I just uh, point that the COVID-19 pandemic has reviewed challenges for national, national statistical offices, uh, especially for the demographic um, or demography uh, studies. The next population census is essential for updating our population's projections. And as I said, especially for subnational levels, and uncertainty that uh, is, I guess, is the, the only certain um, thing that we know is that uncertainty will accompany us for the next years. We will probably need to revise our projections sooner than usual because we, we actually really don't know what's going to happen to all the, the, the demographic components from now on. And of course, the population count before the census, census is desirable in Brazil. And um, so besides uncertainty, we have lots of work to do. And all the discussion with the, the delegations here will be uh, very productive. Thank you very much. Muito obrigada. Thank you, Ms. Isabel. Now I request presentation from Professor Jiang Puri, China Population and Development Research Center, Government of China. Uh, okay. Um Hello, everyone. I will click this. I'm Chuyen Zhang. Please wait a minute. Okay, let's start. And uh, I'm Sunan Zhang from China Population and uh, Development Research Center. I'm very happy to share some latest re results based on our uh, population dynamics monitoring data. I will quickly go through what's happened in the last two years. And uh, because we have many, we have lies cases for 
uh, dies. So I mainly, can mainly focus on the birth changes in the last two years. And uh, I think you, you may all know wow. before the pandemic, the Chinese fertility is already very low. And uh, even we have the two child policy, we only capture the very temporary increase for the birth numbers. And uh, then we, we have observed a down, downward trend for the birth, annual birth numbers. And in the last two years, we even reached the record low birth number and uh, also the record low fertility and 1.3. And uh, again, a little bit much. Okay. And uh, regarding to the pandemic situation in China, already as our director mentioned, we have less confirmed cases. We have, we have less deaths and also because the effective measures by the government taken, so the social anxiety is much lower. And also the government take many measures to ensure the people's livelihood and employment. So we have lower on employment employment rate. So with, within this context and uh, the, uh, sorry. And uh, even with this concepting, but uh, we still witnessed uh, the delayed marriage and the delayed childbearing. And uh, this figure show what's the number change for the birth registration in the last two years. And uh, in 2020, we witnessed a 12% decline. For the first nine months in this year, if we compare with last year, there's only 0.1% decline. But if we compare with 2019, the decline reached 17.5%. Uh, it means people are still postponing their uh, marriage. It will affect the future first birth in next years. And uh, okay. And also based on the, on the survey, we can we have seen uh, both in Hubei province and also for the national level, people are changing their fertility plan. Uh, and 53% uh, of in Hubei province, they have changed the fertility plan. And also the people, for the young people, for the urban residents and the couples already have one child, they are more likely to change. And the people in relatively higher age and uh, for the reproductive group and the people who pr plan to have a second ch child, they are more likely to abandon their family uh, family plan because of the pandemic. And also for the national level, the latest survey conducted by our commission have shown for the people who still have for the fertility plan before the pandemic, that 32% have affected and the majority are postponed and about 16% they abandoned their fertility plan. So it's, it's, it could be a very sad story. We, we still, okay. And uh, we look forward in future, they could uh, uh, realize part of the fertility plan. And uh, why the people change their fertility plan? There's three top three reasons. First, they wor worry about uh, there could be some potential impact uh, if they take the vaccination. Uh, they worry about the, uh, the health of the futures and they worry about uh, they may reach some, difficulty to take the maternal and uh, health services during a special period. And also they worry about they could not maintain the uh, very stable income and family, family savings. And now let's look at what's the changes for the last two years. And I will show you the monthly birth change. From this figure, we can see the monthly birth changes in the past uh, four years. And we can see it's relatively stable in 2018 and 2019, but uh, we see a very drastic decline in 2020. And also this year, uh, 
still declining, but uh, the, the decline is not so stronger as the previous year. And we com if we compare the monthly birth with the same months in previous year, we can see uh, in 2020, especially in the November and uh, December, the decline is much stronger than previous 10 months. And uh, after January in this year, it got a grand recovery uh, for the monthly birth if we look at it in this way. And then we look at uh, which age group they are, uh, they are postponed childbearing or the um, uh, giving up their birth. We can see uh, in last two years, the most young age group, which we hear uh, stands for the people aged below, they uh, postpone their uh, childbearing and they reach a very higher strong uh, declining and a drop, and uh, this trend continues for the 2021, for the first nine months, still declining for the much stronger for the people aged uh, below 30. And uh, we also look at uh, which parity are more affected by the pandemic. We can see, if you look at the left figure, we can see the first birth, for the first birth, the most drastic decline still came from the, the young age group. And for the second birth, the decline come from all the age groups. So it means for the young people, they are, they are ham, having lies uh, first birth, but for the second birth, it means it also reflects the survey results for the people who already have one child, they are postponed their second child. So, this is very a match with the survey results. And uh, because we have the monthly registration data, so we are very lucky to use this kind of data to look at the monthly changes. We can see uh, these two figures both show you what's happened for the first birth in the last two years. And we, if you look at the green bar, it means it stands for the people uh, aged below 30. We can see how it uh, declined over time, over months, we can see from the first uh, 2020, it already declined for the first 10 months, but uh, it increased uh, declining in the last two months. The same trend is still continuing in the, this year, the first nine months, uh, also confirmed the young people are postponed first child. And uh, if you look at the second child, we can see in last year, all the age group, they are giving much less a second child, and this trend continues in this year and they even become much stronger in this year. So it means the second, for the people who are planning to give a second child, they are more uh, delay their fertility plan, and uh, we still worry about what could be the situation for the second birth in this year. And uh, in order to compare between the, among the provincial level, we compare the crude birth rate by month. And uh, here we select the, January, uh, the October 2020 and the, and the compare point. And uh, we pre compare the pre-pandemic and also the post-pandemic. We can see all the provinces, they have witnessed a drastic decline for the crude birth rates, because we have the latest census, so we use the census data and we use our birth registration data for provincial level. So we captured this kind of universal decline for the uh, crude birth rates. And uh, if I sum up, we, we would like to confirm the outbreak of COVID-19 further depressed our country's birth number in the last two years because much people, much less childbearing in past two years, especially for the young people, and especially for the first, first birth, and especially for the young people who are giving first birth. And also we captured the uh, impact for the uh, COVID-19 because much less births also occurred in November and December, and also, uh, we capture the second birth postponed because it's dropped too sharply in the last two years for all age groups. It means people are postponed second birth universally. 
And we also captured the monthly crude birth rates went down and with a national level will be 13% of the crude birth rate decline. And we also uh, worry about the future because the first the marriage are declining in the last two years and until this year the first nine months is still declining if, you comp if we compare to uh, 2019. And also the people, because we, our country already have 200, no, 2 point million, 2 point billion vaccination. Okay, 2.4 billion vaccination. So pe for, the young, for the people who take vaccination, they are postponed child bearing. So it could be a factor future buses. But we still have some positive sign, and our director already mentioned we our country and both national and the local government have taken supportive measures to help family to deal with the difficulty for the epidemic, have bring on marriage and childbirth, and also more social and family support have been in fact, and also the child care system is already under construction. So we would like to look forward for the future, but uh, con considering the uh, data collection and also the impact uh, monitoring for future, we would like to, uh, yeah, for the uncertainty already the previous speaker have, have mentioned, and also our country have already conducted the survey to explore the factors which affects the people's uh, fertility intention and the child-bearing behavior. And uh, in future, we may also conduct more surveys to uh, identify the difficulties they are facing and uh, to help the government to, to draft a more policy to support uh, the people. And also we would like to uh, suggest to uh, timely collect the data and also uh, Stressen the population dynamics and monitoring and uh, to look at the short term and long term evaluation of the COVID 19 on the population dynamics. And also, we already, all the results I have mentioned is based on our monthly or uh, and monthly birth registration and also the vital registration for the birth. And, uh, we look forward for the, in the future, we use much more data, including birth, death, and marriage, marriage registration to conduct more uh, deeply uh, research to help evaluate the impact of COVID-19 future. I think uh, that's all I want to share with you at this stage, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Zhang. Now I request presentation from Dr. Himanshu Soha. Joint Director, National Center for Disease Control, Government of India. Thank you very much, sir. I so if uh, if uh, somebody could just give me a go ahead that uh, the slide is visible and uh, I'm audible. I'll... Yeah, yeah, it is visible and you're on. Please carry it. Thanks, Please sir. Carry. Thank you very much, sir. So, uh, honorable excellencies, uh, uh, respected. The demographic impact of COVID 19 in India. Uh, just to give you a snapshot, uh, we are all uh, well aware uh, that uh, the world is uh, uh, not out uh, of uh, the woods yet as far as COVID 19. Details of the figures, but uh, Dr. Sohan, your audio is getting 
uh, sir, I'll use the mic uh, that I have. So I hope it is better now, sir. I'm using uh, a headphone. Yeah. yeah, it is good. So uh, we, we know that uh, even today the world uh, is seeing uh, something like 400,000 uh, cases a day, more than 400,000 cases a day and uh, more than 4,000 uh, deaths every day. So, so the situation remains grim. Uh, some of uh, the countries are in a relatively better position, uh, while some are seeing uh, a definite uh, surge. Uh, if, if we look at uh, the situation in India, uh, we see that uh, after the second wave, uh, which we, the peak we hit was around 400,000 uh, cases uh, a single day. From there, we have uh, come uh, a lot uh, uh, ahead uh, and the situation is uh, much better. Uh, looking at the active cases we have at the moment, 95,000 something active cases uh, and the case fatality rate is amongst the lowest uh, uh, globally at around 1.37%. Uh, so this, the, a lot of effort has gone into uh, managing this uh, situation uh, and bringing it to its current level. Uh, uh, while uh, the world is, while we were uh, uh, seeing a decline in terms of uh, the second wave that was due to Delta, then uh, the Omicron uh, threat uh, uh, started emerging on uh, the global arena. And uh, as of date, uh, we know that 53 countries have uh, already reported around 1,000 uh, plus cases of Omicron. Uh, probably they are much more than that. Uh, in, the, in the weeks to come, we'll be getting a clearer picture. Uh, as far as India is concerned, we have 23 confirmed cases uh, uh, from five states, uh, and the situation is uh, uh, under close uh, monitoring uh, at, uh, at, at the highest levels. Uh, uh, what, what we saw uh, uh, in India was uh, that uh, there, there was, uh, during the first, uh, first uh, part of uh, the pandemic, when it had just emerged uh, globally and it was declared a pandemic, uh, there, there was uh, a decline in uh, the real GDP up to the tune of, and the sources uh, IMF here uh, to the tune of 7.3%. Uh, but then uh, uh, the, the swift action uh, and policy response to the pandemic, uh, including uh, the fiscal support and the economic uh, reforms, uh, they, they led to uh, a bounce back uh, and uh, the, the projections uh, appear to be good uh, for the coming years. Uh, uh, our response can be seen on this slide uh, broadly as uh, starting from uh, when the first few cases emerged in India, the focus was mainly on uh, tracing the contacts and uh, for the first couple of uh, uh, cases, uh, more than 100 contacts per case uh, were tracked and that was the norm, almost every case that was detected, uh, there was rigorous contact tracing uh, and from one uh, COVID lab uh, that was there in the country which could confirm the cases, uh, We've come a long way since uh, then up uh, to more than 1,000 labs uh, currently. We acknowledge the support of uh, WHO in uh, training and capacity building activities during the initial part of uh, the pandemic. Uh, this was followed by a national lockdown, uh, which provided us uh, the opportunity to review uh, and uh, uh, enhance our preparedness measures uh, and uh, uh, this, this provided uh, a very useful and critical input uh, at that stage uh, when the cases were still at a low uh, number in India. And when the wave did come, uh, we, we were much better prepared uh, uh, than what we were uh, at the start. Uh, so currently, we are looking at uh, a testing rate, which is uh, amongst uh, the highest uh, in, in the bigger countries. Uh, and uh, some more than 25 million contacts so far uh, had already been tracked. And at some stage, uh, we, we, uh, we could not keep uh, a track of, because it was the states which were doing it. So at the national level, uh, real time figures of contact tracing and other activities. So my point is that these numbers are not reflecting the, the effort that has been uh, put in uh, uh, by the states uh, and the country as a whole. Uh, and then the vaccine uh, preparations and uh, capacity building so by January this year, there were already vaccine dry runs uh, happening in uh, all the states and UTs, and it was rolled out finally on 16th January. Uh, just talking about it uh, a bit uh, more. Uh, so this, this is uh, the, the largest free vaccination campaign globally. Uh, and uh, it is the, the, the motto of uh, uh, this vaccination program is to ensure that vaccines are available for everyone and they are available uh, free for everyone. Now. Uh, talking about uh, the 360 degree multi-level uh, response uh, that, that uh, the government of India uh, had, uh, 
the first thing was uh, the governance. So without the political will, uh, such such a major response could not have taken place. So uh, there was uh, political will at the highest level uh, right from day one. Honorable Prime Minister uh, uh, has been monitoring the situation at his personal level, uh, and therefore the entire government uh, and the government's Lord Trump, uh, is uh, involved in the response. Uh, there was a rational deployment uh, of uh, uh, health workforce, uh, including task shifting, capacity building, uh, and education and training uh, infrastructural uh, uh, augmentation. Uh, the vaccination drive I've already talked about, it happens to be one of the biggest uh, vaccination, the biggest vaccination uh, drive uh, in, in, in the history. Uh, essential supplies like oxygen, diagnostics, and PPE uh, were firmed up. Uh, at one stage, India was an importer of uh, PPE. And today, India happens to be one of the largest exporters of uh, personal uh, protective equipment. Uh, uh, in taking into consideration the needs of the people, uh, insurance schemes uh, like uh, Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Yojana package, which is uh, a, a, an insurance scheme uh, uh, for the poor uh, uh, that, that was put in place. Uh, there were robust IT initiatives. Some of them I'll be talking about in a moment. Uh, for service management systems uh, and then community involvement uh, the, the next stage of uh, the vaccination drive has gone to the people uh, at every doorstep uh, people are being approached uh, at their household levels uh, and ascertained and motivated for vaccination now so i was mentioning about honorable uh, prime minister's daily monitoring and oversight uh, and it's a continuous engagement with chief ministers and state health ministers at the level of uh, prime minister uh, there have been group of minister meetings uh, monitoring uh, the situation uh, continuously the ministry of health and family welfare has a joint monitoring group uh, to to uh, closely watch uh, the situation and the who incident management team is also involved uh, uh, I, I've talked about uh, some of these uh, uh, in, uh, so I wouldn't like to go into the detail given the paucity of time, but uh, we have uh, the, the, the response required uh, a huge redeployment uh, because the healthcare system uh, wasn't uh, geared, and nobody in the world was uh, prepared for uh, such, such, uh, such a uh, pandemic. Uh, I mean, uh, it was uh, a, a huge task. Uh, but uh, redeploying the staff from non-affected areas and facilities, uh, substantive health insurance packages uh, and virtual training packages. Uh, we have our own uh, iGOT, which is a virtual training uh, digital platform. Uh, so they, they all helped in uh, boosting up of, uh, our uh, health workforce response. Uh, uh, we know that in India, uh, there have been at least uh, two indigenous uh, vaccines. Uh, Covaxin is an indigenous inactivated vaccine. It has been found to be more than 78% effective. Uh, and there are six indigenous manufacturers as well. Uh, we've also, uh, the country has uh, uh, exported vaccines under the vaccine matri, which is uh, the, in, the, the Hindi name for friendship. Uh, so as part of that initiative, uh, some 70 million plus doses have been uh, supplied to 95 countries. This data is as on 22nd November, uh, and uh, uh, that, that's a breakdown of uh, uh, So not only for uh, the population of, uh, of India, but also for uh, the world, uh, this vaccine uh, manufacturing capacity of India has been uh, uh, utilized. Uh, there was a phase during the second wave when oxygen uh, uh, became uh, an issue of concern. Uh, and the government of India initiated uh, responses which uh, ranged from uh, oxygen expresses, wherein uh, uh, oxygen was delivered uh, some 14,500 metric tons of uh, liquid medical oxygen to the nation. It was a huge task that required coordination uh, between various stakeholders uh, and right at the uh, very top of uh, the governance. Uh, but this was managed. Uh, and then the testing was another major uh, uh, area where uh, self-sufficiency was uh, obtained in a very uh, short period of time. Uh, I'll talk about the existing strategies just very briefly. Uh, I mentioned about the financing part wherein uh, insurance scheme, this is to the tune of 22.3 billion uh, USDs uh, for the poor to help them fight the battle against uh, the pandemic. Uh, uh, recently, the health budget has also witnessed uh, a huge upsurge uh, to the tune of more than 130% uh, increase uh, in the health and wellness component. Uh, amidst the pandemic, uh, India worked on a new set of e-governance solutions. This was very critical as uh, uh, the social distancing norms and the COVID-appropriate behavior uh, forced uh, people to go virtual in a virtual mode. Uh, so teleconsultation services, uh, Pan-India Telemedicine Network of more than 150,000 uh, health and wellness centers uh, 
I talked about the Government of India online training platform. Uh, and then we had our Arogya Setu app, which is a contact tracing uh, app, utilizes the Bluetooth uh, availability on the mobile phone. Uh, this and uh, now the world-renowned uh, COVID app, uh, which is uh, people can easily get themselves registered uh, and then find the nearest uh, vaccination center, approach that, and then download the vaccination certificate once it is uh, done. So everything uh, in a digital mode uh, uh, has been uh, ensured. Uh, this is uh, just some snapshots of uh, the COVID. Uh, the important features are, as I mentioned, it's uh, an end-to-end -end solution uh, for vaccination, right from the registration of the person uh, to ensuring that his vaccination certificate can be downloaded. Uh, uh, the, the latest uh, in the vaccination uh, front is uh, the door-to-door -door, uh, component, the community involvement part of this. This is a modified outreach session uh, with a staggered approach. Uh, it utilizes, uh, utilizes the mass media and digital platforms. Uh, every uh, household in the country would be approached to ascertain if, if the people uh, have been vaccinated, they'll be motivated if there are reasons uh, for uh, lack of response. Uh, uh, they'll be at risk. Uh, so so uh, this has been announced by the Honorable Prime Minister uh, uh, recently. Uh, I'd like to end uh, with uh, uh, a, a quote from uh, the Honorable Prime Minister of India. Uh, if we want the world to be a better place to live, we have to treat it as one unit. Uh, if we want economic growth to be pervasive, we have to make people its partners. And if we want the process of development to be sustainable, we have to work with the environment. Thank you very much. I end the presentation with a salute to the healthcare uh, heroes of the COVID pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chauhan. Uh, before the next presentation, I request all the participants to please post in the chat box your questions on the points you would like to discuss. So there is a session ahead that is coming on. I request all of you to post the discussion points in the chat box, please. Now I request presentation from Mr. Andrew Galkin, Director of the Department of Demographic and Family Politics, Government of Russia. Mr. Andrew, please. Good day, Mr. Dear colleagues, uh, good day. Again, as I said, uh, the demographic uh, grow, uh, development of the uh, population is the priority of the government of the Russia by 2020. Uh, uh, in 2007, we started the very broad demographic uh, program, and uh, from that time, uh, the program just grew. And uh, uh, the scale was very broad, and uh, we uh, managed to, to uh, increase uh, the measures of demographic uh, uh, program. Um, demographic uh, uh, program uh, is very important for the government of, of the Russian Federation. This program was adopted for 10 years and uh, go uh, going up to the 2006. Uh, uh, 16 and uh, then uh, the demographic program uh, is uh, improving all the time we are spreading the directions and approaches that are used and measures that are used for the population for improving of their uh, residential and uh, educational medical uh, uh, um, um, uh, benefits uh, then they get some uh, they get quite a lot of money for the birth of the second uh, uh, birth uh, uh, the, the, it's a family capital uh, which motivates uh, the um, uh, uh, we call it maternal capital and uh, then it was always also covered covers the birth of the sec of the first uh, uh, b uh, child as well uh, so about 12 uh, million uh, women received or families received that uh, uh, motherhood uh, fund uh, which uh, they uh, use uh, for the family uh, benefits. The uh, uh, amount of this fund is indexed so that uh, it uh, keeps growing and corresponds, uh, and it, it's about uh, six, uh, uh, 6,000 US dollars. And for the second um, uh, 
uh, for the second child about sixteen thousand uh, uh, dollars uh, uh, US dollars if uh, uh, the family uh, hasn't received the first amount for the first child. So this is the motivation program uh, uh, for the uh, motivation of the of the birth uh, rate. Uh, the 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 support uh, fund uh, uh, also goes for the uh, uh, age of uh, three years old of the child. So uh, thanks to all those measures, the uh, birth rate uh, uh, grew, and uh, by one point eight, uh, the uh, number of the population started growing. Uh, uh, the modern demographic situation. Uh, uh, is uh, determined by young women and uh, the childbirth rate. Uh, many uh, families uh, uh, experience uh, material uh, problems and challenges, uh, including the ones caused by uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, so the, the, we're combating the uh, poverty uh, rate, uh, uh, and uh, there are a lot of federal measures um, of support uh, of uh, the of the child of the children up to 17 years old if the income of the family is lower the uh, set um, set level of the uh, set national level. Um, and then uh, the uh, uh, support and fund uh, depends on the age of the child and the income of the family. So uh, uh, quite a lot of a big segment of population receives uh, that government uh, support, uh, material support. So starting from next uh, year, uh, pregnant women will uh, receive additional uh, funds, monetary funds, uh, and uh, that uh, receiving of this fund is made very flexible and comfortable for the families to receive. Uh, this is a set uh, um, uh, family uh, treasury uh, which works uh, or different and develops different measures uh, aimed at supporting support uh, uh, the families uh, and uh, that uh, uh, reacts to the requests and doesn't uh, 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 doesn't demand uh, additional documents to prove so that works very effectively for uh, different material support of families including um, a maternity fund and other sorts of funds if uh, a young family wants to um, um, get born to buy a new apartment that is quite easy to uh, to do it's uh, very easy to do uh, the decision of the family for a birth of the child uh, uh, um, uh, so the uh, child, uh, then the, the family can take uh, the bond with at a very low interest rate uh, for the uh, birth of the child, which they can use to improve their living conditions. Uh, for the second, uh, for the third child, uh, and uh, all other uh, uh, other uh, the next children, fourth and fifth, and so on, uh, the family receives additional uh, material 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 funds, uh, which uh, uh, can be used by the uh, family uh, to their needs. About uh, ninety percent of uh, the children of the school age uh, receive support and care at schools and uh, educational uh, institutions. And uh, this is one of the additional measures uh, uh, which was introduced because of the COVID-19 uh, impact. Besides, uh, uh, the, uh, so the the the, the child birth depends a lot on the family values and for uh, spreading of the family various values in, uh, in the community and we think uh, that uh, the child birth is a very important uh, basis and support uh, greatest value of the family and this approach has been adopted by the government in the measures uh, and aimed at motivation of the childbirth. Uh, 
the government together with uh, non-commercial organizations uh, have developed a lot of uh, uh, different measures uh, to support uh, young families uh, and uh, uh, then the families which are planning uh, to get to have a child. Um, then we uh, also have a special order or special uh, uh, pledge that uh, or award that families who have uh, more than uh, uh, three children are awarded. And uh, then besides uh, 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 besides the um, award they get uh, the monetary support in the amount of about 1,300 1, uh, 1, US dollars. And uh, then all those measures for motivation and support of uh, the uh, families, especially uh, uh, with low income uh, are developed and improved uh, and uh, all, uh, all, as well as the measures aimed at improvement of the medical care, health care and education. Uh, then uh, uh, the ad additional uh, measures are uh, uh, worked out for regarding the uh, um, employment. Uh, now, with the appearance of uh, new uh, types of, uh, uh, of COVID, uh, the, uh, government, the government policy is aimed at the increase of their income and uh, uh, support to especially low-income uh, uh, low uh, families. Uh, so that they, they have their trust in and believe in future, so they uh, uh, know and they, they are confident in their uh, uh, in their futures. So we are prepared to work at different platforms, including BRICS for the uh, development and sharing of experience, developing of new effective measures that are aimed at the support of our demogra demogra demographic uh, situation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Now I request presentation from Mr. Jacques Van Zuena, Chief Director, Population and Development, Department of Social Development, Government of South Africa. Thank you very much, um, Chairperson, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening, um, distinguished colleagues. Um, the hosts will share my presentation. Uh, let's just see when it comes up. Um, good, thank you very much. Um, we can move to the next slide. I'll obviously pre present on South Africa in relation to the same theme. Um, as the Director General of Social Development indicated in the opening remarks, without any doubt, the COVID-19 crisis has exposed pre-pandemic fault lines and laid bare some sobering truths about our world and obviously about our own country as well. Even though the full impact of the pandemic is still emerging, we are already witnessing its immediate measurable impact on morbidity and mortality and mobility. Emerging impacts result from the socioeconomic disruptions that it caused and affect the most vulnerable, children, youth, women, older persons, and persons with disabilities. I will, in my presentation, um, elaborate these themes um, as they have been observed in South Africa, as well as in the entire African continent. Next slide, please. Um, just by way of background, South Africa is the smallest of the BRICS member countries. Our population is slightly above 60 million and grew by 1% in the past year. The over 60 population 
which is the population most vulnerable to the direct impacts of COVID-19, is 5.5 million people, which is about 9.1% of the total population. South Africa has experienced the highest levels of COVID-19 spread and mortality in sub-Saharan Africa. In the past week, the reported cases of COVID-19 in South Africa surpassed 3 million, and the reported COVID-19 deaths passed 90,000. Important also to note is that the so-called excess deaths that have been recorded since May 2020 in our country have been 273,239. So that's basically the number of deaths that have been recorded more than what was projected on the basis of mortality trends in the previous two years. Um, so whilst COVID-19 has had a devastating social and economic impact, the change in the population age structure is minimal. However, the following indicators of, of mortality were impacted by COVID. There was a significant rise in deaths in 2021, approximately by 34% from the previous years. South Africa experienced both our first and second wave of the pandemic in 2020 and in the period December, January between 2020 and 21, um, as well as the third wave started rising in June 2021 and the fourth wave is rising as we speak. This resulted in a significant increase in the cruise death rate within a year from 8.7 deaths per thousand people to 11.6 deaths per thousand people. When one takes these mortality figures um, and then recalculates the life expectancy at birth, um, there's obviously been an impact as well. So our life expectancy at birth declined from 65.5 on average to 62 years. So that is by three, three and a half years. Um, also important, I think, as is the case in most countries, no significant impact on child mortality levels have occurred due to COVID-19. The other directly measurable impact of COVID-19 in the country has been on migration. There's been a marked reduction in international migration into and out of the country which is obviously indicative of the COVID-19 travel restrictions globally over the past 16 months. But also internal mobility in the country. Um, sorry, um, can we go back to the previous slide, please? Um, internal mobility in the, within the country in this period um, has also reduced and, and many movements have been of a temporary nature. The COVID-19 travel restrictions has particularly hit our tourism sector very hard, and I'll uh, make a few remarks later on the significance on that. In terms of um, sectoral impacts of COVID-19, I'll refer to a few. Um, the most obviously has been in the health sector. Um, and in addition to the direct impact of COVID itself on hospitalizations, um, etc. Major disruptions have been witnessed in the area of sexual reproductive health and rights, including maternal health, family planning, and youth-friendly services. So that was basically because um, the supply chains of family planning commodities were disrupted, especially when COVID hit at first. Um, Often service delivery points would be temporarily closed because of COVID cases inside the service delivery point. Um, also, people um, reported reduced access to services due to the movement restrictions that were imposed, particularly in the first wave of COVID. And of course, their own fear of contracting COVID-19 at health facilities. There is also emerging evidence of increased teenage pregnancies during the course of last year.
there is some technical snag. Mr. Jacques, could you could you hear? Um, Chairperson, I'm back. Um, if you can hear me, please indicate. Yeah, I can hear. Please continue. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, there was just a, a power interruption, it seems. So I had to move over to my phone for connection. Um, an additional health impact, which probably was less anticipated, um, was the impact of um, COVID-19 on mental health. Um, and there has been a reported rise in mental illness associated with the increased social isolation, disruptions in daily life routines and pressures associated with the loss of livelihoods. Um, and the diversion of resources for other critical health care needs to COVID-19 responses. In our country, incidents of sexual and gender-based violence, including intimate partner violence, were also noted to be on the rise during the pandemic. The, um, we can move to the next slide. Um, the the um, major next area of impact of COVID-19 in our country has been on education and training because there has been a widespread full closure of learning institutions um, during many parts of last year. Um, and although there was a phased reopening of schools, the emergence of other waves of the pan pandemic and next waves of the pandemic continue to pose a challenge with high likelihood of further disruption to academic calendars and learning. In the context of physical closure of learning institutions, efforts to enable the continuation of learning have hinged on homeschooling and open distance and e-learning strategies. These digital platforms are of course dependent on internet access and electricity, and therefore left learners in many rural areas as well as the poor urban areas of, of our country further behind. The consequences of the closure of schools and other training institutions have notable potential to undermine the development of human capital that is required to honor the demographic dividend to which our Director General referred in his opening remarks. Not only will, will there be a long-term impact on learning outcomes, but it is also very likely that a lot of young people may indefinitely drop out of the education system. In the area of employment and livelihoods, we have seen that the steps that were taken to control the spread of the pandemic have had a great economic impact in South Africa in 2020. Um, our GDP declined significantly during the year, um, and that led to large-scale job losses and reduced incomes. Um, women and youth have been disproportionately affected by the jobs and income losses across the country because a large proportion of these groups are engaged in the informal sector and in the hospitality sector. And it's particularly with reference to the hospitality sector um, that the, um, the, the decline in tourism has been impacting, of course. 
for us as population scientists and demographers, um, we've also come across many data and measurement challenges. Um, and of course, um, one of the key challenges for evidence-informed decision-making um, in the country is a lack of adequate quality and timely data. Um, COVID-19 has amplified the need for such strengthening such data and measurement, but at the same time, COVID-19 has made it very difficult to collect data in traditional ways. And I think one practical example is that due to COVID-19, we had to postpone our national census, which was supposed to take place in October this year, um, to a point in time during next year. Various response strategies and innovations have been deployed in South Africa across various sectors in order to cushion citizens against the adverse effects of the pandemic. Um, for example, in the social sector, in education, um, and, and, and in view of the challenges that I've mentioned earlier in relation to internet, um, online learning um, has also been provided through the use of radio stations and television education programming. Um, and in cases, school materials were also delivered to remote learning areas. In the area of sexual and reproductive health and rights, um, we've embarked on social media campaigns and information services to young people um, in, in um, digital formats. Um, and then the, the, the financially major part of the um, government support um, measures in relation to the impact of COVID has been in the area of social protection, um, social grants, have been um, ramped up to cushion citizens against the adverse economic impacts of the pandemic. So, for example, provision was made through the Unemployment Insurance Fund to support um, people who temporarily lost their jobs due to COVID measures um, last year. A solidarity fund was established with the private sector um, to also pool resources in order to um, render support into certain sectors. In many instances, food parcels have been distributed by the government as well as civil society organizations. And then we've implemented a, so, the so-called 350 Rand COVID-19 social relief of distress um, fund, which basically provided um, um, monetary support equivalent roughly to about 25, 26 US dollars per month um, to people who have lost um, all their income as a consequence of COVID-19. And then what was also introduced was a caregiver grant, which was basically um, paid to the caregivers of children who were in receipt of the child support grant in order to assist those caregivers to provide better support um, to, the, to the children that they, they were caring for. Um, in conclusion, um, I think just four points. The one is the, the short-term demographic impacts of COVID-19 in South Africa were mostly on mortality and consequently life expectancy and on migration and mobility, as I've indicated. The pandemic itself and the measures that have been taken to protect the population against a much greater impact of the pandemic have had impacts on several determinants of future population trends. For example, poverty and inequality and education. Additionally, behavioral responses to the pandemic and or the protective measures could have similar impacts, for example, on children's health, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and sexual and gender-based violence, as I've indicated. And then, of course, at this point in time, um, and I think we, we, we agree with the other presenters from the other countries as well, that the quantification of the, these impacts is difficult because of data collection challenges, but also because too many variables at this point in time still remain uncertain.
in terms of policy lessons that we have learned thus far, um, first and foremost, in the context of this meeting, um, key policy recommendations are that post-COVID-19 recovery and reconstruction plans need to be informed and sustained by evidence of population dynamics. Secondly, it is imperative that we also invest in data and measurement to inform both long-term and short-term responses to COVID-19 and similar disasters that may occur in the future. It will also allow us to build on our data analysis and understanding of the pandemic. Thirdly, it is now abundantly clear that vulnerable groups require special attention in our immediate responses to COVID-19, as they've been disproportionately affected, and often the responses in place against the effects of the pandemic do not adequately address their needs. Long-term recovery plans and post-COVID-19 measures must especially target the youth, women and persons with disabilities and address challenges that intensify during the pandemic, such as sexual and gender-based violence, substance abuse and mental health. This means that if countries are not careful, the crisis will further widen pre-existing inequalities. As we build back better, vulnerable groups will need targeted interventions. Obrigado, spasibo, thank you very much, Shishini. Thank you. The next session is on discussion, question and answers. This session will be chaired by Mr. Linton Machino, Acting Director General, Department of Social Development, Government of South Africa. I request Mr. Linton to take this session and carry on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, chair of the previous session that we've just had. We've just had wonderful uh, presentations um, by um, the various countries. And I think that some of the work that is, uh, that is being done uh, in the various countries is really, really amazing. And I think there are brilliant lessons for us to learn uh, from, uh, from, this, um, from, from what other countries are doing, particularly uh, with regards to trying to um, uh, find ways of um, uh, of um, uh, moving sort of beyond the pandemic and of, of course responding uh, in terms of the impact uh, of the pandemic. But again, a very important point uh, that again cuts across uh, all the presentations that were done today is around data collection, the importance of data collection to really determine the impact of the, um, of the pandemic and uh, to ensure that uh, we have evidence that is linked to that. So we improve our decision-making, particularly uh, as we try and recover and restore um, uh, post uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, things are not becoming easier with uh, the inclusion now, or rather the uh, new variant that is going around in the world. Um, and uh, of course, we are taking um, a number of lessons from countries that have, um, uh, that have managed to um, uh, firstly vaccinate a majority of their populations, uh, but of course, also um, to ensure that um, uh, the various measures that are put in place to safeguard um, uh, the gains that have been made um, so that the countries do not get into um, uh, economic uh, challenges, social economic challenges, etc. So the relief measures put out by various countries is really encouraging. Um, and the collaboration um, is really encouraging. And there's just such a, um, a, a good level of um, uh, of uh, uh, collegiality and camaraderie um, around um, uh, member states, particularly member states of the South, um, as it comes to um, uh, matters pertaining to COVID-19 and how we are all responding to these. So thank you very much. This session, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is of course the question and answer session. Um, and um, you would note that um, there is a facility on the screen that enables you uh, to ask questions um, and how I suggest we do it is we will take um, the first two rounds of, let's say, four questions. Um, and uh, you are able to type your question in irrespective of the language uh, that you would utilize. Um, and uh, we will then get the interpreters to assist us 
in reading the questions and then of course getting the specific colleagues uh, to respond to the questions. Um, and uh, your questions are posed, can be posed to the presenters this morning. So to Professor uh, Ku Ling, um, um, of the Republic of China, People's Republic of China, to uh, Ms. Isabel uh, Mari uh, from, the, um, uh, from, from the government of Brazil, uh, Mr. Jacques Van Zayden from South Africa, and then uh, Mr. Uh, Andre uh, Kalkin from Russia, and of course, uh, Dr. C, uh, Sijit um, Sujit uh, Kumar from uh, India. So what I would suggest we do is that we shoot straight into the questions um, and um, we will then um, get guidance from the uh, from the interpreters whether there are in, any questions that have come in as yet. Um, I don't see any questions yet. So we will take the first three if there are uh, if there are some questions coming in now. I still don't see any questions. Um, Chair, um, I, I, I see two questions to China that are in the Q&A box. Um, and then also, I think Isabel's hand was up. Um, but but there are the two questions um, to China that are in the Q&A box. Okay, um, Jacques, I'm not sure whether it's a question. Uh, it looks like a comment, anonymous attendee. Can we really explain the drop in marriages as such? Uh, were the services um, offered during COVID-19 lockdowns to those who wish to get married? Were the services rather? Were the services um, offered during COVID-19 uh, lockdowns to those who wished to get married? Um, I'm not too sure who would like to take that one. Excuse me, I think that was a question for me. I'm not so sure, but I think it was for Brazil's presentation. Uh, yes, I Okay, please go ahead and respond to it then, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to congratulate all the panelists for all the great presentations. And thanks for the, the question. I think it was, um, Mr. Linton, are you talking to us? I can hear you. No, oh, okay. Um, so thanks for the question. I think it was really for my presentation. And, and thanks because I, I really forgot to mention that. Um, the registration offices didn't close totally uh, during the, the beginning, in the beginning of the, the pandemic, but it, they reduced the hours of services all in the whole country. So of course there was uh, some difficulties in getting to um, um, marriages registration as, as also for birth and that's registration re registrations also. And so part of it, part of the, the increase in, in, in or the decrease in marriages registrations can be because of social distancing, distancing measures. And so people couldn't, mobility was redu reduced and also was difficult, more difficult to get to the offices so what we have to do is to, to still uh, observe the registration of these statistics uh, to see what's really going on, if it was really a, a point in time and, and, register, um, and marriages went back to, to normal uh, levels and also for births. But for births, we, we, already, we have already seen that they still went down in the beginning of to 2021, so it's just not, not a me measure. Um, it's not a matter of, of delayed registration or delayed registration, but maybe uh, a, a, a decrease in the number of births. Thank you.
Well, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that response. I hope that the, um, the, the person who's made a request or rather made, uh, put the question is adequately addressed. I will quickly go to the next one. Um, and it's from Cornelius Hunewald. Um, and it says issues relate regarding human rights were less uh, emphasized in the presentations, uh, but are important. The issue about um, compulsory vaccinations comes to mind. Any comment to address uh, this aspect, perhaps? And let me, um, for this question, um, uh, let me ask, um, um, I will ask maybe, maybe uh, our panelists can give us uh, just a brief, a, a one minute response to this question by Cornelius. Can we start, maybe Jacques, would you like to come in on that quickly? And then we'll come to uh, Mr. Mr. Andy, and uh, uh, Andrew. Jacques, do you want to take a bite at that? Um, yes, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and, and thank you very much, Connie, for this very important question. Um, yes, um, of course, um, human rights are important, and, um, and um, I think one of the, the, the um, things that... I've, I've made reference to in, in the presentation, um, but 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 maybe what that one should just emphasise is that um, there's been a great concern around the enjoyment of sexual and reproductive health and rights, and of course um, the rights that um, are supposed to protect um, women um, and uh, other vulnerable individuals um, against violence. Um, so, 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 um, the the pandemic definitely has demonstrated its potential to infringe on human rights, and um, one one has to, in one's responses, try to ensure that, that the rights agenda does not get abandoned in the process. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm the right person to express myself on um, on. Um, vaccination and um, rights associated therewith. I think that is a conversation that is taking place in our country at the highest level between um, different stakeholder communities, of course, led by the government. Um, I think our leadership has made it clear that nobody will be forced to vaccinate. Um, but at the same time, I think part of the sort of emerging logic is that um, that um, that people also have the right to be protected um, against those who maybe choose not to vaccinate and, and, and therefore carry greater risks with them. Um, but, but, but it is an ongoing conversation in our country. And, and I think it would be very interesting for us to hear from the other BRICS member countries as well what the thinking um, in, in their countries are around around this issue um, because um, I think it's a debate that is emerging everywhere at the moment. Um, thank thank you. you. And I think to just um, um, to, 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 to just flag that before Cornelius's question, there was another question by Willis as well, yes. which I'd like to ask you to just come back to after you've dealt with this round on, on Cornelius's question. Thank you. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you very much, Jack. It'll be interesting to get Russia's views on this. Uh, Mr. Andre, just quickly on this question, and then we'll go to the People's Republic of China, Professor uh, Kuling afterwards. Спасибо, председатель, за предоставление слова. По поводу соблюдения прав человека. Regarding uh, the human rights and uh, vaccination the position of the government of the russian federation and the president of the russian federation at uh, the moment is uh, the basic right of any person uh, or rights should be observed and uh, the person can choose whether to be vaccinated or not. We don't have the mandatory vaccination and has not been introduced. 
and this uh, issue uh, uh, has been considered on the level of the uh, government and the president of the Russian Federation constantly uh, monitored uh, and we monitor the dynamics of the pandemic. Uh, uh, it is a very complicated uh, issue uh, that should be treated uh, from various aspects at uh, at uh, the moment, uh, we think uh, that the mandatory vaccination uh, is uh, the violation of human rights. So that's why we are uh, uh, supporting the program, uh, or outreaching the program of, uh, regarding the importance of vaccination. But uh, so far, uh, uh, on all the channels, we, um, we use all uh, TV channels, mass media, and it, uh, the campaign has been quite uh, uh, successful. And uh, we have open information regarding the mortality and uh, uh, the, the, the number of cases. And uh, people, most people in especially big cities come to the uh, realization that vaccination is important for their work and their life. Regarding mandatory vaccination, there has not been any decisions taken and uh, it, uh, the issue will be considered in the uh, future. What I would what I would recommend we do now is um, there was a question that was asked uh, by. Um, in fact, I'd like for for India perhaps to come in now uh, to respond on this question, and then um, I would then like for the People's Republic of China to uh, respond to the question that has been posed by Mr. Willis uh, uh, Odek um, regarding. Uh, and the question is thanks to China for the presentation. This is what he says, and then even though. The country has recorded about 128,245 um, uh, confirmed COVID cases. What is the national mortality? After the pandemic, um, have remarkable changes uh, been seen in the crude and age specific death rates? Uh, and this is from uh, uh, Willis Odek, who is at UNFPA in South Africa. Um, I would like for the um, uh, Professor Kuling to come in quickly and respond to that. And then I'll quickly come back to India um, uh, to give us a sense um, uh, from Dr. Kumar. So um, at this point, Professor Zhang uh, Kuling. Okay, thanks for Will read this question and repost the question in the Q box. And uh, here I would like to uh, I would like to tell you some numbers. First, the total population in China is 1.4 billion, according to the 2020 census, and the annually deaths will be around 10 million. So, if we now look at the the deaths according to the COVID-19 is only 5,000. So, in my in my view, it is not bring significant change for the crude, crude death rates. And also, we still need to look at more detailed age-specific age data to look at the results. But I don't think there will be much, much big change because the total population size and also for the numbers in each age group. Of course, the people who aged in higher age, like 60, 80, they will affect the age specific death rates, but uh, we still look and still need to uh, use the census data to look at the results. If we have any update, I would like to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, colleague uh, from the People's Republic of China. Um, I'd like to ask um, our colleague from, uh, from India now, um, um, Dr. Kumar, uh, if you can respond to the question um, that was asked uh, by Cornelius with regards to the human rights aspect, uh, whether uh, issues regarding human rights were less emphasized um, in the presentations, um, but are important. The issue about compulsory vaccinations comes to mind. Any comments to address this aspect? Uh, thank you, Chair. 
uh, uh, Professor Kumar is not here right now. Is at what was the minister? So I'm just filling in for him, and uh, I'm the advisor here for family planning and uh, maternal health care in the ministry. And uh, regarding that query that you raised about the human rights and um, COVID vaccinations, all of us recognize that human rights are important, but so are human lives. So that has to be behind the policy of the government. While we do not have any mandatory policy over here uh, to vaccinate each and every person by force, but we believe that the evidence has shown that vaccination has been able to reduce the mortality substantially as well as the morbidity substantially. That has been brought out very clearly. So say after the first, after the second wave, when around 65% of our population got vaccinated, now we are not seeing so many of our um, uh, COVID cases lining up in the hospitals anymore. So our hospital beds are comfortably uh, available. So are all the equipments. So there's no pressure as, as such on the system, even though uh, your COVID and pandemic is still moving, going on. Secondly, another thing, another evidence that is there here right now is that Omicron, uh, which is coming. And because of the Omicron, these numbers that we are getting, the infection numbers across around, I think, how much, 40 countries in the world. And even there, what we see is the severity of those Omicron Delta, uh, Omicron variant is not very much. It's not really posed as a major public health problem as of now, uh, and, the, and the hospital admissions are under control, and so are the um, and so are the COVID deaths. That being the case, we believe that uh, vaccination is probably the way to go uh, to reduce the chances of mobility in the general population. Having said so, we really we do have a program uh, which is in the name of our honourable prime minister. Uh, to, go, to go to every single household and really counsel the uh, counsel the, uh, the, the, the people there about the advantages of vaccination. So when you're counseling the people over there, many of them get converted and the vaccine hesitancy disappears. It appears that uh, the, 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 the perceived side effects of the vaccines have not been very well explained to the people at large. So when we're going from house to house, all our workers are on the ground. We are able to convert at least 30 to 40 percent of those clients who otherwise had vaccine hesitancy, agreeing to have the vaccine. So although we do not have a mandatory policy, but we have a proactive policy to reach people and provide the vaccines to them so that we are able to uh, actually con uh, cover majority of a population. And all of us know that if you have a vaccination rate of say 75 to 80 percent, you build up the herd immunity, you stand a better chance of surviving the pandemic. So that is the uh, knowledge said lessons that we have learned from our experience with the vaccines as well as the pandemic. Uh, so, so, and we are really putting into practice. Back to you, Chair. of um, um, of uh, health and, and welfare, um, much appreciated. We've just got two more questions left, um, or three qu questions rather, and I will ask uh, very quickly. Uh, there's a question um, regarding uh, what are the other member states experiencing besides South Africa with regards to education and training? I would like for um, uh, the People's Republic of China to respond to that one um, around education and training. And then I would like for India, or oh, sorry, for Russia, uh, and Brazil to respond to the question uh, regarding um, uh, whether there could be um, any successes in positioning population dynamics to guide allocation uh, or earmarking financing for COVID-19 recovery, uh, uh, especially drawing, uh, especially uh, sp special drawing rights, debt relief, uh, or uh, suspension initiatives. So we'll ask very quickly uh, for Brazil and uh, Russia to respond uh, to, to that question. Uh, let's go to Brazil now and then to Russia. I don't, before we go further, I'd just like to say uh, something about the compulsory of vaccination in Brazil. Can I, can I add to that? Yes. Indeed. Okay. So, uh, all right. So vaccination is not compulsory in Brazil. 
And I'd also like to add some numbers. Uh, Brazil has reached 600, 616,000 deaths by COVID by now. And um, although vaccination is not compulsory, we have already um, vaccinated 77% of, of population with at least one dose and 64% of, of, of complete vaccination, um, which means one or two doses. And, 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 and that's have, has, have um, decreased a lot um, in the, the last months. Um, according to, and I, think, and I understand the question, um, successes in position and population dynamics to get a location. Well, if I understand it correctly, as I said, uh, demographics is only uh, a part of it, a part of the problem. So um, um, showing um, where the least um, advantaged or privileged people are in what the, the regions they, are, they suffered more in Brazil um, um, is the, the beginning of, of, of a plan, a political plan to tackle uh, uh, the pandemics and to, to make life easier for those people and, 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 and to react to health services to attend these people. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that response, Brazil. Can I quickly ask Russia uh, to respond to the same question very quickly uh, before I come back uh, to the People's Republic of China? Mr. Andre uh, Galkin, the question that was posed. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so the question regarding the uh, debit uh, and, uh, during the uh, pandemic, oh, there were measures of uh, support of the population, which. Uh, uh, uh it, it's not uh, the uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's the payment of taxes. Uh, and the business uh, got the delay for the uh, uh, taxes uh, to the budget. And uh, also there were complex uh, programs for the favorable uh, credits uh, for the, uh, uh, aimed specifically for the um, salaries uh, to the people who were temporarily uh, uh, were not involved in in employment due to the COVID because the, the institutions were closed uh, for during like for example different restaurants, uh, shops, and uh, other public places. Uh, at the same time, uh, the the the. Uh, uh, when the staff couldn't uh, couldn't work and they were uh, let uh, 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 so they were not allowed to come to the working place but they received their salaries in full so the salaries to the staff members as for so people business needed uh, money for that and uh, they could approach the banks to get some uh, credits so to pay their uh, salaries and the banks uh, were forced they had to give uh, so uh, um, uh, credits so at very favorable interest rates and uh, the uh, procedure of receiving those credits were simplified um, that's regarding the uh, the tax uh, tax uh, holidays and uh, debit uh, relief uh, regarding training and education uh, especially professional education uh, many uh, of our educational institutions are uh, higher institution educational institutions as schools uh, were uh, closed or moved to uh, remote education 
and uh, 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 the remote education was really uh, improved and got that impetus of, of getting uh, developed. Uh, and at the moment, uh, uh, the level uh, the level of that remote education before and after or during the COVID period, it uh, uh, is evident that it has grown a lot. And uh, it's uh, now it's uh, absolutely obvious that uh, uh, you can now get education online uh, regarding professional uh, uh, professional training and education, especially, for example, uh, mothers who are on maternity leave. There also was uh, a program, uh, professional training program developed uh, aimed at um, uh, those uh, uh, sections of populations. Then uh, the, all the uh, online, you could also get certain services uh, uh, connected with the job searching uh, or training or retraining, uh, and that could be also done online. Uh, in the Russian Federation, everything for, for the uh, maximum level was uh, uh, digitized. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, uh, to my colleague. Uh, from um, uh, the from the from Russia. Um, at this point, I will quickly go to um, uh, China. If you can quickly respond, the People's Republic of China, on the issues around training and education, and how you um, you managed uh, during this time with regards to uh, training and education, your experiences in this regard, and then we will come to South Africa to close off. Uh, with regards to the question asked um, on um, accurate figures on how many people are on the brink of starvation due to COVID, uh, due to the lockdown and, and uh, job losses. Um, I'd like to hand over to the People's Republic of China. Regarding to the training and education, um, I, I think all of you know, our country have very high development level for the internet. So most of the people in China, we share a e-life, but the convenience. During the lockdown of the COVID-19, I think the people start to use e-learning both for the all kinds of education, both the primary and the middle school and the high school. I think we share very, much common with other countries, so I will not talk about more. And for the uh, job loss and also for the uh, starvation, I don't think we, uh, in our country, we have big progress rates in poverty elevation. See, last year we have pronouncement the, uh, there's, there's no, and absolute poverty county level. So we, we don't think we have this kind of serious problem. And also our government already takes so many measures uh, like a tax reduction and uh, give all kinds of allowance for the, for the company and for the employee during the lockdown. So I think the government takes so many measures to deal with this kind of difficulty in the difficult time. So to help people to uh, deal with this kind of uh, special period to let the life could be go down as normal. Okay, I would like to share and I mentioned earlier. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, colleague from the People's Republic of China. Um, uh, at this point, I'd quickly like to ask uh, South Africa to respond to the question um, around um, how many people are on the brink of starvation due to lockdowns and job uh, losses? And I think that this question essentially cuts across um, um, all the other member states because we do know that the lockdown has had um, tremendous negative impact on job losses. Um, uh, so I, I think um, it, uh, to some extent, all, the, all member states experience this. Jacques, if you could quickly come in uh, on this question, I'll give you about uh, just a minute uh, and thereafter, um, I will introduce uh, the Honourable Minister. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you very much, and, and thanks very much for the question. Um, I think um, 
maybe just for the benefit of participants outside of South Africa that they don't just use the terminology that um, that 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 um, you might not be familiar with. Um, we have had in the country a running national income dynamics survey for quite a long period of time, um, and <clears throat> that was. Um, adapted or innovated into what's referred to as the Coronavirus Rapid Mobile Survey, or CRAM, um, through which, you know, um, methodology was improvised in order to collect data in spite of, of the challenges that, that I alluded to in my presentation. Now, um, that survey um, found that during April, May 2021, about 2.3 million households in South Africa reported child hunger. Um, now, just to give a perspective, that is almost one in seven households reported during those months that, that, that um, children had been going hungry. And then there was also an Ipsos survey that found that um, about 40% of South Africans of all age groups um, reported having been affected by hunger in the in the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now it's so 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 that is plus minus as much as we know. Um, and 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 obviously one needs to try and find out much more. But I think these do, do just maybe indicate that these um, these findings were obviously key to the government's decision to um, continue implementing the COVID-19 um, Social Relief of Distress grant, which is a small grant, um, but um, I, it has made the difference between starvation and survival um, for many households um, and, and individuals in the country. Um, I think one, one of the things that we really need to sharpen up is our data collection by municipalities as well as within the Department of Social Development to, um, to reactivate our, our capturing of indigency in the, in, in the country, et cetera, so that um, one not only has total numbers, that one also knows where are people who are most in need um, so that we can ensure that our social relief of distress measures reach everybody. Um, and of course, I mean, in terms of sustainable solution, this 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 is one of the fault lines that COVID has exposed. Um, so 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 COVID has almost made the case for basic income grant in our country, um, and obviously re-emphasised the importance of um, of generating economic growth that does create jobs. Um, because thus far, we've seen many jobs have not come back. Um, into the economy yet, and 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 one has to, um, together with the private sector, find ways of of of, of um, making sure that we um, we bring back the jobs that have been lost thus far. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, Jacques. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to the presenters um, for responding to all those questions, and thank you to all, all the participants who have made uh, their contributions. At this point in time, I'd like to introduce the Honorable Minister of Social Development of the Republic of South Africa, uh, Excellency uh, Minister Lindy Wazulu, um, who is a member of the National Executive Committee of the uh, ruling party in South Africa, the Ash African National Congress. She has also held a number of portfolios, uh, including uh, heading uh, communications. She's currently heading the International Relations uh, committee within uh, the African National Congress. She's been a former minister um, of uh, small business development. She's also been a former uh, uh, member of the provincial legislature. Uh, she uh, is been a former advisor to the president on international relations and um, uh, is now the minister of social development in the Republic of South Africa. Uh, and uh, she is uh, passionate about uh, women and youth empowerment. Um, and at this point in time, I'd like to call on the Honorable Minister to provide us uh, with a way forward uh, and concluding remarks uh, um, uh, as we round up our, our, our engagement uh, this afternoon. Honorable Minister, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mpunu. And um, 
thank you very much to everyone who is uh, on the on the platform. This is definitely the new way of uh, uh, doing things. Um, I I managed to connect uh, from time to time to the meeting, but obviously due to other engagements, I was not able to connect to the webinar um, throughout. But uh, distinguished leaders and delegates from senior government officials of the BRICS member countries and experts, other participants from different sectors in BRICS members, esteemed ladies and gentlemen. And I will say, um, whichever way is Dobri Udra or Dobri Dane, somewhere else is Bonjia or Botarde, uh, where we speak uh, Portuguese. And those of us who are English, um, I don't know, it's a good morning or good afternoon, uh, to a to good day to everyone. Let me first take this opportunity to thank everybody who participated today. Um, it's important that we keep uh, BRICS alive. Uh, it's important uh, that despite all the challenges that we are facing, that we cannot meet uh, physically, but we can meet as we are meeting here. And it's just as effective uh, as, as, as um, physical meetings might be, but you know, we are human beings. We prefer to be able to meet and shake hands and look at each other and do that, but unfortunately we can't do that right now. And this was the fifth BRICS meeting on the population matter since 2013. One meeting has been held under each member's term as chair. The framework for BRICS cooperation on population matters operates according to the principles of equality, transparency, efficiency, mutual understanding and consensus. It is an open-ended uh, progressive uh, that we, we, we have to uh, focus on. And of course, from a South African perspective, population and development is, is critical. And I think under these circumstances, particularly of BRICS, I mean of um, COVID-19 and a whole range of other challenges that we might face as uh, nations in general, but as BRICS in particular, we need to um, connect to each other and continuously engage and not just only wake up when we are going to, we are expected to have uh, these kind of meetings. The framework that we have intends to add value to existing intergovernmental and multilateral initiatives and is supportive of the work done in the United Nations context on population and related social matters and contributes to the ICPD program of action beyond 2014 and the sustainable development goals. The agenda for the implementation of the framework emphasizes the co that cooperation and population-related matters will be pursued through capacity building and training, exchange of information, knowledge and expertise, sharing of best practices and lessons learned through national experience, best practices and challenges. Today's meeting certainly met the expectation that we agreed upon when we drafted the framework and agenda particularly because we further strengthened the mutual understanding of current demographic trends in our respective countries, and because we exchange a significant amount of information, knowledge, and expertise. At the same time, I believe many questions remain. Yeah, I, at least I did manage to hear some of the answers from the questions that were posed again on the platform. Uh, but many questions remain which could and should be explored deeper. And many questions may only be answered over time as the pandemic continues to unfold and as its impact become clearer over time. The envisaged outcome of this meeting was to provide an opportunity to share BRICS countries' experience and develop joint steps towards reaching a better understanding of how population dynamics interact with pandemics in general, and in this case, COVID-19, and how demographic science can provide new insights into how the pandemic may unfold and the intensity and type of measures we need to, how to slow it down. We believe that the discussions uh, today demonstrated our collective commitment um, to continue uh, to work uh, uh, together. We undertake to work with the outgoing and incoming chairs of BRICS to produce a report on the meeting 
which will capture both the lessons we learned from today's deliberations, as well as the recommendations that we have been made in presentation and during the discussions. Um, we wish to thank the government of Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And I thank you also as a minister, and I'm sure that uh, generalization is also about the people in the departments who participated and who continue to uh, work on the, on the uh, programs. Um, po we are, population matters must remain alive, vibrant, and productive over the past eight years that what we have done. And we pledge the commitment of South African government to continue to work with yourselves to strengthen and deepen the importance, the important work area. I have no doubt that today's meeting provided an important platform for us all as BRICS member states to share our country's experience and develop joint steps towards reaching a better understanding of how population dynamics interact with pandemics, in this case, COVID-19, and how demographic science can provide new insights into how the pandemic may unfold and intensify and type of measures we need to, to slow it down. We need to rekindle our country's continued commitment towards the BRICS cooperation on population matters, but also generally on all matters that we agree upon for the benefit of our people and our countries. I wish to thank you. Well, thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for those, uh, for those very powerful uh, words and closing remarks, at least, um, uh, or way forward rather, um, um, and really highlighting the importance uh, of, um, of sharing country experiences. And I think that this platform really lays a good foundation for us to do that, particularly with regards to issues that are related to uh, population dynamics, um, uh, which are very critical issues in terms of our forward looking and forward planning uh, as member states. So thank you so much, uh, Minister, for that uh, very, very uh, powerful closing um, or way forward um, in terms of uh, um, uh, this particular conference. Um, and uh, we really appreciate the fact that you were able to take time uh, to join us and, and indeed uh, deliver your remarks uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, I, in China, I think it's in the morning now. In Brazil, it's probably uh, late in the night, if I'm not mistaken, or the other way around. <laughs> so at this point in time, ladies and gentlemen, um, we, we, are, we are at the end, and I'd like to call on um, uh, Dr. Uh, Sig, uh, Sigda, uh, who is the advisor for family planning and maternal health uh, in the government of India. Uh, to um, deliver a vote of thanks uh, uh, as we close off this very important webinar uh, this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Sigda, over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Excellencies, Honorable Minister, dignitaries, experts, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this important occasion. At first, I would like to thank and acknowledge the monumental contribution, the global medical fraternity, which includes all health workers, doctors, nurses, and personnel of infectious and other disease hospital, dispensaries, ambulances, who have done and doing their duty in this difficult and dangerous conditions and trying times. They have and are continuing to show determination in the fight against COVID-19. Our best wishes are with them and their families in these trying times. I'm extremely grateful to our Honorable Union Minister of Health and Family Welfare, Dr. Mansook Mandavia, for leading the country's health program from the front. I'm also thankful to Mr. Rajesh Bhushan, Secretary, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, for his continuous guidance. And I'm thankful to Dr. Ashok Babu, Joint Secretary, Government of India, for chairing up the session and continuously mentoring to achieve universal health coverage. I'm extremely grateful and uh, to Honorable Minister for Social Development of South Africa, Ms. Lenvi Zulu and the South African government for hosting this important webinar with us. I'm also extremely thankful to Diu Zizu, Commissioner, Department of Population Surveillance and Family Development, National Health Commission, Government of China, uh, Mr. Andre Galkin, Director of the Department for Demographic and Family Politics and the representative from Brazil for their valued presence and active participation in this webinar. I'm also extremely thankful to all the presenters and experts for sharing their country-specific experiences and making this webinar a great cross-learning platform. I thank each and every one of you from different countries 
including the interpreters, interpreters who have worked hard behind the scenes to make this event a grand success through their valuable contributions. As the global burden of novel coronavirus disease continues to astonish us, India and other partnering countries of the break face the threat of a serious COVID-19 outbreak that would have substantial and long-term consequences due to our large population, which comprise around 40% of the global population. I strongly believe that the learnings from this webinar will help each one of us as a country, and we will stay participants thank you once again for your participation thank you thank you thank you so much um uh, dr, dr. sigda for those uh, um uh, for, for the vote of thanks ladies and gentlemen we have now come to the end of our webinar uh, and i want to um, um uh, I, I don't want to say anything else because i think the minister and dr sigda have said it all uh, we are at the end now, and I want to thank everybody for participating in this very important uh, webinar. Thank you for all your questions um, and the responses, all the participants that have uh, uh, that have engaged. We really look forward to another engagement very soon um, on these matters. We will be able to um, take stock of some of the issues that uh, have been raised even in this meeting, but also see how we are dealing um, with the with the pandemic and further share um, experiences uh, within the context of our BRICS configuration. And so we want to uh, really thank you um, uh, for participating in this very important session. This session is now adjourned. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.